Over the last five years, the NFL and its scouts have been forced to rethink how they evaluate the quarterback position. The Patrick Mahomes went 10th in the draft because he was viewed as too big of a wild card. Josh Allen was deemed inaccurate and too sporadic, was the third quarterback drafted in his class in the same year that Lamar Jackson was the 32nd overall pick in the draft. In 2020, Jalen Hurts goes in the second round in the same draft where Tua Tungavailoa was selected over the much more physically talented Justin Herbert because his college tape was better. We could point to any number of reasons, whether that be improved scheming, new technology, better position coaches as to why these more raw, toolsy quarterbacks are working out nowadays. And perhaps that's a conversation and a video topic for another day. But the bottom line is that the cat is out of the bag and everyone is looking for that next boom or bust quarterback to cash that big lottery ticket and hit a home run at the quarterback position. So in this video, we are gonna be discussing Anthony Richardson, Florida quarterback, and asking, is he worth that price of admission, a high first round draft pick for a chance at hitting a home run at that quarterback position? But before we do get started, I do ask if you enjoy, please do hit that like button down below. It takes just a second. It's the easiest, freest way to support my channel. I really appreciate it. And also subscribe because there is another quarterback prospect in this draft that is also fairly boomer bust that I just might have to make a similar video like this one coming soon. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. And lastly, if you do enjoy my draft content, I wanna let you know that you can get even more of it and support my channel via my Patreon at patreon.com slash that franchise guy. There you'll get access to my complete draft board with player write-ups, strengths and weaknesses, pro comps, you name it. You'll also get exclusive film room episodes. We already did one on Anthony Richardson there on Patreon and into April, you will get team-specific seven-round mock drafts for all 32 teams. So if you enjoy my draft content, you want more of it, and you want to support my channel, it would not be possible to do what I do without my amazing supporters on Patreon, especially now that they're starting to demonetize a lot of this stuff. So it's going to be even more important that I get some help from you guys there on Patreon to help this thing go. And so check that out, patreon.com slash that franchise guy, and let's get into it. So I've just finished diving into Richardson's tape, and I gotta say he's a much different player than I expected to find. To be brutally honest, with Richardson being in his first year as a full-time starter, and after what we saw in last year's draft with Malik Willis, Matt Corral, and Sam Howell, I kind of expected Florida to use Anthony Richardson in kind of a neutered down, gimmicky, RPO and QB run heavy offense where similar to those other quarterbacks, it would be difficult to watch his tape and walk away with any idea if this guy can read a defense and run an NFL offense. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that that was not the case with Anthony Richardson. To their credit, Florida actually asked Richardson to read out NFL style route combinations. And though he has a really, really long way to go before he can do this consistently at a high level in the NFL, at least there are a few dozen examples on Richardson's tape of him taking seven step drops, asking what the coverage is and making NFL throws with anticipation. And for this reason, he's simply a much higher level prospect than that list of guys with Willis, Corral, and Howell last year because he's put on tape that he can do this stuff, even if it isn't always pretty. With those other three guys, it was all just like elementary offense, RPOs left and right. They didn't even ask them to do NFL stuff. So this play against Tennessee is one of my favorite examples of this on the season. Here we've got the Gators running a classic mesh concept that we see in the NFL every single game, every single week. You've got two underneath crossers with a hitch layered over the middle on top of them. The quarterback is supposed to read the triangle. And if the mid zone defenders crash down on those crossing routes, typically that hitch route over the middle of the field will be wide open against most zone coverages. So here, Tennessee runs an inverted cover three with the middle linebacker actually dropping into a deep third, like a free safety. And the two safeties here are buzzing down into those intermediate hook zones. Richardson reads this out perfectly. 
The picture isn't clear right away, but he doesn't panic when his first read gets muddied up like this. He stays calm in the pocket, waits for those intermediate defenders to declare, and the second the safeties break down on the crossers, Richardson pulls the trigger on the hitch route. And he gets some bonus points here as well by throwing the ball with perfect outside leverage away from the closest defender, which makes the catch easier for the receiver, but also allows him to open up to the outside and actually get an essential yard on this play that was the difference in picking up the first down. Now this is just one play, and to be fair, you can get lucky on one play. But part of why this is one of my favorite plays from him is that before I saw this play, I had noted that he struggles with inverted zones, where he could get locked up when that post-snap picture looks different than what he expected pre-snap. Just a few weeks earlier against Kentucky, they broke him with an inverted cover two coverage. He was expecting the corner here to bail backwards into some form of single coverage, be it cover four, cover three, cover one, because he has a single high pre-snap look. This would have given the receiver complete leverage on his out route, and he should have been open. But when the corner ends up coming down into a flats zone, he squeezes that route and Richardson freezes. He stares it down and ultimately he ends up bailing from the pocket and ends up taking a sack. Clearly he was thrown off by this inverted zone. Uh, and perhaps even more significantly, earlier in that very Tennessee game where we watched that mesh concept, that same inverted cover two spooked him immediately to the point that he took off and ran before doing much reading of the defense at all. Both of those plays on third down, by the way. But as we saw, the next time he got an inverted coverage, inside that same game with the mesh concept, he was able to stay calm and read it out. Now that might sound really insignificant, but when you're talking about a raw quarterback that is going to have to develop at the next level, this ability to keep plays in his memory bank, to react in real time within a game, week to week, that's the type of incremental developments that he's gonna have to show over the next four or five years if he's gonna reach that high potential that he has. You know, Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts are some of the best quarterbacks in the league right now. Straight up, they sucked when they came into the league. They really did. And look where they're at now. And it's because of those incremental, uh, incremental developments and the week-to-week -week attention to detail. And it's, it's not just this inverted zone stuff. There were other observations I had from him where you could see those incremental improvements. Let's take a look at the very first start of his career. This year, week one against Utah. Here, Florida was running a play-action shot play, which we'd soon come to learn is a big staple of the Gators' offense from this year. They loaded up some added protection from the back and the tight end, and for good reason, because the protection is actually perfect here, but Richardson ends up creating pressure for himself by rolling out of the pocket. It sets his running back up for failure to the point that he actually catches a holding call, so none of this would have mattered, and Richardson ends up having to make the throw from an additional five yards back with a hurried release, where you could certainly make the argument that the ball ends up underthrown. Now I want you to watch Florida call up almost the exact same shot play later in that game. The blitz comes, granted, slightly different, but from the same direction, but this time Richardson steps inside. He doesn't end up throwing this because, well, the routes aren't open, but if he did, he would have had a clean pocket to work from to deliver a clean ball, and this allowed him to better survey the field to see that a massive escape lane opened up and he got a huge run out of this that I'm not showing you because of copyright. And as the season went on, time and time again, I saw Richardson in these exact same kind of looking pressure situations step up instead of trying to gain depth and dip outside of the pocket. Again, very, very subtle, but it's these kind of incremental improvements that you're gonna need to see from Richardson at the next level. It's just really good to know that he is willing to watch the tape and take feedback and be coachable, right? Now, something Richardson did consistently, really since week one, that actually gives me a lot of hope for his future outlook is how well he sees the middle intermediate part of the field and how often he was able to attack that part of the field with excellent anticipation. With the rise of play action in the NFL, 
being able to read out this middle of the field and to layer the ball into the weakness of a zone defense behind the linebackers and underneath the safeties is essential especially in Richardson's case, where A, if he's lucky, he'll end up on a team that is smart enough to tap into his running ability and lean into the threat of play action, which will naturally draw in those linebackers and make these areas of the field even more open. But also in Richardson's case, B, where just like in college, because of the threat of his legs, he's likely to see a lot of zone coverage because it's simply harder to defend scrambles from man coverage. So it's a big deal that a big chunk of Richardson's best tape in the drop back passing game comes when he's attacking this intermediate part of the field. There's a bunch of plays to look at here that I've been showing you, but I wanna highlight this throw that is actually an incompletion and in the red zone. So there aren't any safeties over the top, but I do think it shows a, a, it's a great play to show how he has a good understanding of how to level the ball over the head of the linebackers. And I also, by the way, just wanna highlight just how stupid strong Anthony Richardson's arm is. But here we've got a standard red zone coverage where the defense is going to end up matching across the board. You see this all the time. Uh, and Florida knows this is coming, and they draw up a great play with the tight end running a quick hitch here to suck in the linebacker, which creates a very tight window to drop the ball in behind him before the safety can squeeze this slant route from the left side receiver. And that corner is going to be occupied by this running back. He's the last line of defense to anything coming towards the sideline there. Now again, this pass ends up falling incomplete because the tight end doesn't do his job on this play. He tries to be the hero and tries to catch this ball thinking it's just a high pointed ball, but in reality, Richardson's throwing this to the receiver on the back end of the end zone. So if the tight end never puts his hands up here, this ball literally knocks the apple off of his head and lands into the receiver's chest for a spectacular touchdown pass. This might not seem like much, but scoring down in the red zone is one of the hardest, most important things a quarterback can do. And this type of read and throw are, is only something that a handful of quarterbacks in the NFL even think about attempting, let alone pull off. This is like Mahomes, Rodgers, Herbert, Brady type of precision in the red zone right here. Matt Ryan ain't making this throw. Kirk Cousins ain't making this throw. Now these are all more small but important details on what there is to like about Richardson, but there are some very, very obvious reasons to like him as well that just can't go without being said. And that of course are the physical tools that he has. We've hinted at it, but Anthony Richardson is basically everybody's created player in Madden, where you want the young, big quarterback with the ridiculous arm and speed, and then you're just gonna let the rest take care of itself. And that's Anthony Richardson. So for one, his arm talent teeters right on the line of NFL elite. And exactly like what I said about Justin Herbert coming out, I believe Anthony Richardson will have one of the five strongest arms in the NFL on the day he gets drafted. We already highlighted his velocity on that red zone throw against Tennessee, but that ball only went about 15 yards. Richardson has one of those F you arms, or to keep it PG with another term I like to use, a sea ball hit ball arm, where he can put the ball wherever he wants, whenever the f he wants. This doesn't just lead to some sick highlights, but having this kind of arm opens up the entire playbook because there isn't a throw he can't make. You wanna force the defense to defend a deep out from the opposite hash? No problem. A shot play pushing the ball 65 plus yards down the field? Yeah, Anthony Richardson can handle it. It also just opens up his margin for error as he learns the position. If he ends up a split second late on a throw, oftentimes the velocity on his ball can and will make up for it. Oh yeah, and not only will he have a top five arm in the NFL when he gets drafted, but he's going to be a top five athlete and runner of the football at his position the second he gets drafted. Richardson's running ability will provide so much for an offense if used correctly. This speaks for itself. He's gonna raise the floor of your offense. And by tapping into the numbers advantage that Richardson will provide as a run threat, in addition to his scrambling ability, 
He's going to provide explosive plays in the passing game with his legs, and it's also going to act as a sort of training wheels or a crutch that he can go to to get out of a pinch if he misses a read or fails to pick up a blitz early on in his career. This scrambling ability will also force defenses to shorten their own playbook. We mentioned earlier that teams are kind of forced to play zone against them, and if you play man, you have to use an extra defender in coverage to spy him. Simply put, Richardson has the type of tools that just don't come around every year. And forget about every year, he very well may be a generational athlete. Like, if he were to declare as a tight end alone, I think he might be a top 50 pick in this draft. That speaks to how special of an athlete he is. Now, you might be saying, well, why is he not a generational quarterback? And why is he not the consensus number one pick in the draft? And well, to put it kindly... Uh, he's got a lot of improvement to do. To be a little bit more blunt, there's a lot of things that he does as a quarterback that are just bad. So let's talk about his biggest weaknesses here. I've got three points that I really want to highlight with him. Number one is accuracy. Number two is pocket presence. And number three is the post-snap processing ability from him. These are all critical aspects of playing the quarterback position. So... The accuracy really speaks for itself, and I always like to remind people around draft time that accuracy does not mean the ability to throw an accurate pass. Rather, accuracy is about the ability to consistently throw accurate passes. And this is important to emphasize because I guarantee that by me saying or you saying that Anthony Richardson is inaccurate, you're going to get at least one automated response of a clip of him dropping an absolute dime. And there is no denying that he is capable of throwing dimes on individual plays. And of course, you love to see that. But as you get through his tape, unfortunately, there's just way too many missed throws out there. And many of these are coming on critical downs or are leading to interceptions because sometimes he misses high and over the middle of the field, which is the worst place to miss because there can be a safety sitting right there over the top waiting for an easy interception. Now, one thing we've learned is that through modern coaching practices and technology, it does feel a lot more attainable to improve a quarterback's accuracy. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, it was viewed that accuracy kind of is what it is. You know, we've seen crazy, unprecedented improvements from Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, where at a certain point in those guys' career, they couldn't hit water if they were stranded in the middle of the ocean on a freaking life raft. But now it's a much better part of the game, and through improved footwork, mechanics, repetition, and hard work, they got better at those things to the point where those guys are all now like top 10 quarterbacks. And I'll admit, I, I still believe that a good part of accuracy is kind of untouchable and instinctive, but I also think there are parts of accuracy that can be improved. And part of that with Richardson ties directly into our next knock on him being his pocket presence. A lot of his missed throws actually happen because of poor pocket presence and or poor footwork that lead to him kind of stepping into pressure and making throws harder on himself than they should be. Now, whether this is all footwork or whether this really is just a problem with his natural pocket presence and ability to navigate the pocket, that's a little bit harder of a problem to diagnose here. But this drop back against Vanderbilt is a prime example of what I'm talking about here. Richardson is taking a five-step drop here. And I actually like his footwork all the way up into the point where he takes that first hitch forward right here. But what we see from Richardson all the time is that he doesn't do a good job of feeling out the rush and navigating with his feet towards the open space within the pocket. Rather, we see Richardson typically continue to climb up in the pocket until he either pulls the trigger or scrambles, which on some plays where there is actually room to step up, this works out great and comes off to the naked eye as good pocket presence. But on other plays like this, where those step up lanes aren't there, he should be navigating the pocket to find the open space instead of walking into defenders and creating pressure for himself. So here, after he's taken that first hitch forward, there's no need for him to keep climbing up unless there is a rush threat coming around the bend. 
Here, he could take a new hitch backwards to buy more time, he could stay exactly where he is, but what he can't do is exactly what he ends up doing, where he walks himself forward into pressure, where he has to make this throw with a sped up release, surrounded by defenders, where the ball ends up sailing over the middle. And as we talked about, sometimes there's a safety there waiting for an interception. Case in point B here, we see the same problem against LSU much later in the season. Richardson has a perfectly clean pocket here. There's no need to continue sliding forward and to the right, where he ends up rolling himself into pressure, creating poor angles for his offensive linemen, and he ends up seeing the throw late and throws it high over the middle of the field. The ball gets tipped and intercepted. So some of this, I do believe, is coachable footwork stuff that can improve his comfort level and ultimately his accuracy from within the pocket. But in my experience, having a good pocket presence in general is rarely coachable, and it's typically very instinctive. But pocket presence is also probably the most difficult trait to evaluate for an NFL quarterback because it is so subjective and oftentimes even quarterbacks who are completely oblivious to the rush, guys like Derek Carr, for example, will have individual plays that flash what might look like good pocket presence. And ultimately, this is where I'm at with Anthony Richardson, because while maybe once or twice a game, he'll step up in the pocket and he'll drop a dime or he'll elude a blindside sack to extend the play outside of the pocket. It's probably another three or four times a game where he's walking himself into pressure, bailing from a clean pocket and just not showing that natural ability to know when and how to use his feet to manipulate the pressure and just not showing that natural ability to sense pressure and know when and how to use his feet to manipulate the pocket and when to extend plays. Whether that's running too early or running too late. Evaluating pocket presence to me is all about watching accumulation of dropbacks and asking the question of, is this guy comfortable in the pocket? And my subjective answer to Anthony Richardson at this point in time is no. I think we've seen way too much erratic play in this regard to answer otherwise. And for what it's worth, a big reason I was such a big Josh Allen guy back in 2019 was that my answer to that question was yes, I loved Josh Allen's pocket presence. So in my experience, pocket presence is something that usually doesn't improve a whole lot in time. But to be fair, I can't think of a quarterback I've evaluated with just 12 starts under his belt. And admittedly, I haven't watched a lot of freshman tape from NFL prospects to see if this is something that develops through those first couple of years as a starter. So I can't rule out Richardson turning into a more mellowed out, consistent navigator of the pocket once he gets to the NFL. And then the last big issue that I have with his tape is his post-snap processor. A post-snap processor is how quickly the quarterback is able to read and react to the defense once the bullets start flying, as opposed to a pre-snap processor, which is much more about collecting information to determine what he is likely to see after the snap and where he is likely going to have to go with the football. It's sort of your classic left brain, right brain conversation, where one side is much more about structure and the other side is much more about creativity and reacting to the unknown. And to be honest, I was pleasantly surprised with Anthony Richardson's pre-snap processor. It certainly wasn't perfect, but his ability to anticipate coverages, read the leverage of defenders, and to play within the structure of his first read was all pretty solid. But if the ball got snapped and he didn't get the look that he was anticipating, or if his receiver didn't win, that's where his tape is just all over the place. I saw missed reads that were in plain sight of his field of vision, and we saw a bunch of interceptions or almost interceptions where he just doesn't see zone defenders lurking underneath where he's trying to go with the ball. That bit is very much Jimmy Garoppolo or Tua-esque, where once a week it feels like he's trying to throw the ball to a linebacker underneath that he just didn't see. Now I will give him credit on a few things, first of which, I didn't see him force a whole lot of throws into a first read that wasn't open. He may have gotten tunnel vision and zeroed in on that guy for a little bit too long a couple times, sort of like that inverted cover two that we highlighted earlier against Kentucky, kind of hoping that it would eventually come open. But I don't really remember him forcing something that wasn't there on that first read where it got picked off. So that's good. 
Secondly, some quarterbacks can be really dangerous in these play extension situations. You know, those Jameis Winston, Carson Wentz, or even like Malik Willis from last year with those just F it throws in trouble where he heaves it into double coverage. Richardson was a lot smarter than that with the football. I think I only remember one play like that. And to his credit, His turnover-worthy play percentage was basically cut in half for the second half of the season, so that's another area where we saw some growth. But that's not to say that he didn't put the ball in harm's way for other reasons, like just not seeing zone defenders underneath or overthrowing the football. But again, I really just felt like Richardson's tape when he got beyond that first read was just all over the place. There was definitely some good, but also some bad just erratic and unpredictable in terms of how well he was going to see the field when that first read was not there. And that's all the post-snap processing. So how much he can grow in that regard once he gets to the NFL will be a huge piece of the puzzle, and we just don't really know how that's going to come along. At the end of the day, Anthony Richardson is going to be a first-round pick, whether you like it or not, and probably a top-16 pick. He really is the ultimate lottery ticket, your classic boom or bust player who could end up being an MVP candidate in five years, or he could end up being in the Taysom Hill role in five years. But despite some clear and obvious flaws in his game, the tools are undoubtedly there. He has real traits as a passer to work with, and he showed the types of incremental growth that you'd hope to see from a sort of more raw, toolsy quarterback. So if you're looking for my answer, Yes, Anthony Richardson is absolutely worth the price of admission, and someone should spend a first-round pick on him. Guys, thank you so much for watching. My goal is to get more videos like this out here in the coming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed. We've got lots of draft content coming, a mock draft hopefully within the week. Once I can get into all these quarterbacks tape, we will have top 10 quarterbacks. So those will be the next two videos coming. And again, check out my Patreon if you enjoy the draft content, if you want to show your support. This video might get demonetized, so it would really, really help me out if you guys want to show some love. I really appreciate it. That's patreon.com slash that franchise guy. Until next time, peace out.